We're looking forward to chatting with this next artist. He's danced with some of the biggest artists on the planet, including Prince, Rihanna, Lady Gaga, Celine Dion, Cher, Christina Aguilera, and Michael and Janet Jackson, not to mention his groundbreaking turn as one of Madonna's seven lead dancers during her Blonde Ambition World Tour and accompanying documentary Truth or Dare. Kevin Say is here to talk about his illustrious career as well as a new documentary being released called Strike a Pose, which takes a look at Madonna's seven former dancers and what became of their lives after working with her. Kevin, welcome to the Kelly Alexander Show. Thank you so much for having me. So can we start off, Kevin, by just talking about how you actually got into into dance? Oh my gosh, how did I, how did I get into dance? I uh, I fell into it. I, actually, you know what? Janet Jackson is actually the one who inspired me to dance. Yay! I actually, yay, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I came home from, uh, from Singapore. I was going to school in Singapore. I came back to America and saw her video for Nasty on TV. It rocked my world. I really was like, oh my God, that's so hot. It's so cool. I actually recorded it on VHS tape and played it into a mirror and taught myself the whole routine. Wow. Uh, yeah, and then I performed it at school in Singapore. That is awesome. That is so cool. <laughs> it, was to- it was totally out of nowhere, but it went, went over really well. From that moment on, I was like, oh, well, maybe there is something to this dance thing. And I started taking class when I got to, to college, to USC. And from there, I just sort of uh, I got a scholarship uh, to go to a school outside of school um, while I had some free time. I wasn't doing anything. I was going to travel. I took a year off from school. And uh, I ran out of money and realized, oh, all I've been doing is taking class. And what do I do? Or what can I do? What, I, well, what do I like doing? Well, I like to dance. So I heard there was an audition for an agent. I uh, auditioned for her. She called me up. I signed the next day. Uh, I got an audition the following day and booked that and was working the next week. Wow, that's awesome. And what was your first break where you feel like it took you to the next level for for maybe that that opportunity with Madonna? Oh, gosh. Um, My next break. Uh, You know what what really finished it, I think, was... um, was doing uh, this Pepsi commercial with Vince Patterson. Okay. Like it was, it was maybe two or three months before the tour, uh, and I did this little commercial for Cheyenne, this uh, Spanish artist, and with Lori and Robia, who eventually became Diamond and Pearl with Prince. Um, and it wasn't that, wasn't that big a deal. It was a really short little small gig, but I just worked with them, and when. Madonna brought in Vince Patterson as the choreographer after firing uh, the original choreographer like a week and a half in. Um, he, ke- he kept me as the assistant associate choreographer because he had just worked with me on Pepsi. So I think that was what, that was the gig that sort of nailed it in for me. Cause I wasn't hired as a dancer. I was hired as the associate choreographer and then became one of the dancers when she fired one of the dancers who was originally hired. Oh, wow. Okay. That's like, I always find these interesting stories. Like I know, I, I'm sure you've, you've heard of Kelly Kono and apparently it was after Jennifer Lopez left that she got to, to dance with Janet. So I always think it's cool. I want to hear stories. Yeah. Like these. There's so many backstories. Like there's another Kevin, like there's a, if you look at the Vogue video, there's another dancer in there that never toured with us and never did anything with us. And his, and his name is also Kevin, but I can't remember his last name. Um, but when she saw us all working together, uh, she, she, I guess she liked the, my interactions with everyone better and the sort of diversity that I, brought, that I brought. Wow. So can you talk to us about that first meeting with Madonna? Like, like where was it? In a dance studio? And, and what was your first impressions of her? Because by this point, she obviously already had a uh, huge success. Well, let's see. My first um, sort of face-to-face was literally at the, the Cattle Call audition um, at Alley Cat in Los Angeles. And she was just bringing everybody in in groups of 40. Um, there were maybe even like you know, 3,000 people down the street. And she was just sitting on the floor with her little glasses on and her little tights and bicycle hat and stuff. And we did this really super easy routine. And then she she, she always chose like one or two people, maybe out of the 40, if anybody, and then cut everyone else. You say, thank you, everyone. Bye. Wow. <laughs> um, it was harsh. Um, so you had to be right up front to even get it, have a chance of getting seen. And that was my first time seeing her. She seemed like she just seemed really down to earth. I mean, she wasn't like sitting at a table. She wasn't like, you know, whisked in with lights and bodyguards. She was just sitting on the floor with Nikki Harris, like right at the front of the mirror. And I really, I really liked that. But I also, I also never thought, I never thought of her at the time as being as famous as she was. I didn't realize how worldwide popular she was. Mm-hmm. I mean, after that, I think the next time I saw her was, 
um, out at a club. <laughs> <laughs> nice. She invited me. She invited me to Club Louis, um, and to go dancing. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So at that point, I was just like, oh, hey, she's fun to hang out with. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. And so how did it come about then that you, uh, like, I know that you said that she enjoyed maybe what you were doing better than, than the other guy that was there. What was the process of the seven of you sort of coming together? Let's see. Well, she had auditioned in New York uh, previously to auditioning in Los Angeles. And she already knew that she was hiring um, Jose and Lewis to choreograph her Vogue video. Um, so they were, they already had the gig. Um, and she had brought Slam from New York. So there was fewer spaces uh, available by the time she got to LA, but she did seem to go for just a a nice variety of guys. Like, I don't know if that would ever happen again in this day and age. It seems like everyone's so concerned with this homogenous look and making sure that everybody sort of fits in together that um, I really, I really enjoy the way that she sort of champions diversity and, and, and varying body types and varying heights. And it's not a concern that everyone's, you know, some buff superstar, (laughs) but yeah, we all met actually the first day in in rehearsal. Oh wow! Um, like, yeah, I came in to work with the choreographer who I'd never even met before, and I was being her assistant. Um, and I didn't even literally didn't even know what associate choreographer meant, uh, or even what I was supposed to do as the associate choreographer. So I was just eyes open, ears open, trying to find out where where's my place, who am I, who am I in this group, and it was it was it was sort of. It was dramatic, everybody meeting, because there were such big personalities. My gosh, everyone, everyone was so, uh, like, like, like so bigger than life um, that uh, I had never seen any, anybody with such big personalities working on the same job together. Everyone in L.A. always just seemed so, <laughs> like, so um, calm and simple. And this is, this is a lot already from the first couple days, even. And yeah. how long did it take for you guys to, to sort of gel and, and gel with her? With her, I kept my distance for a while because I, I at the time, I wasn't very available anyways. Um, I didn't really know myself very well or how to even make myself sort of like available to her. Um, but uh, by the time I think we got to America after our first month in Japan, we were all really bonded as a family. Okay. Like even just, you know, in the early, in the early days of rehearsal, um, you know, I really wanted to know these New York guys and who they were and what they were about. Cause I'd never met anybody like that. They were just so over the top. And, um, I used to go hang out at their hotel every night after rehearsal, um, down in West LA, um, just to find out who they were and, 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 and get a sense of, of, what these people were like, especially since at the time I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't gay or straight or out or anything. I'd just been dating this girl and, and that they were like these big loud Queens. And I was like, wait, was this what being gay is? <laughs> I, was like, I really was like asking that same question. I was like, is this, is this what gay is? And am I gay? <laughs> if this is, if this is what gay is, am I gay? <laughs> wow. Can you talk to yeah. us about what she's like as a boss and, and sort of, you know, just being in rehearsal with her? Cause you know, I think we've heard these stories, not that she's a taskmaster, but that she's a taskmaster and she wants things done and, and she expects the best. You know, Madonna expects people to work as hard as she does. And I completely agree. And that's why we never had any problems with that, because I work just as hard as she does. And at the same time, I was going to, I was still going to USC while I was uh, working as an associate choreographer. I was going to classes in the morning, assisting the choreographer in midday, teaching her her steps and teaching the other guys their steps and then going home and writing essays all night. So I was, she was, while well, she was going off to music rehearsals and the boys were heading off to like go chill out and like, you know, hang out at their hotel. I was going off to write my essays and then go hang out with them at at their hotel afterwards. So I think the thing is that she, she, as any good artist does, wants people to take their job seriously and do it well. Um, And if you're a perfectionist, like I am, and she is, then you expect a lot. Um, So I, 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 I don't, I would, she might be a taskmaster in some people's views, but I think that's just paying attention to detail and, and, doing your craft well. Joining us on The Kelly Alexander Show is dancer, choreographer, singer, actor, and director Kevin Stay. You can learn more about him on his website, uh, thatrogueromeo.com. Can you talk to us about what was your favorite part of the tour, and, and did you have a specific song that you just totally adored performing? Uh, my favorite part, you mean a favorite part of the show, or favorite part yeah, of the Yeah, or just being, like, being out on the road, like any of that. 
Well, I could be out on the road forever. Oh, wow, that's <laughs> Honestly, awesome. Honestly, I love touring. I think uh, there's just something magical about waking up in a new city and traveling to a different country day after day and, 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 and also doing it with people that you enjoy and love. If you're on tour, maybe with a group that you didn't like, that might be difficult. But I really grew to, to love everybody on the tour. And, and it was just the travel and adventure of the travel unknown of what's happening day to day. That's what I loved most about touring. Um, and I'm a bit spoiled by that. It's hard for me to imagine myself in any sort of standard situation, like a nine to five where I have to go to the same place every day. Like uh, for the rest of my life, I literally am looking around like what's next, what's new, what can I do now? Like the actual show itself. I think my favorite number was probably uh, keep it together. Oh, cool. Yeah. I really loved the look, the vibe, the style. I liked the choreography. Um, I also enjoyed that we were at the very end of the show. And so we knew exactly what, how much energy we had to give how much we had left <laughs> because it was a very draining show. And also that we were very connected to each other. We got to look at each other. It was a very interactive number where we're, we're running around being crazy, but we're watching each other, looking at each other in the eyes. We're having fun. We know the show is done. We know they've had a great time. Nothing has gone wrong. We get a chance to sort of say hi to everybody and say goodbye. It, it was just a, it's a very, uh, when it says, you know, family affair that really it, it was sort of real for us you know can you talk to us a little bit about what the difference is dancing for madonna versus dancing for janet because obviously they those are two high profile pop stars probably the biggest still on the planet was there a difference because i know you know I've, I've had the opportunity to interview a bunch of janet's dancers and they always talk about what a family situation it was dancing with her and and i get that same vibe from you uh but was there a difference dancing for the two to them well, I think that, I think the Madonna, I think the family affair with Madonna sort of ended with us, honestly, which is sort of, a, it's, it's, it's sort of sad. I think it's that, you know, there, there was a whole lawsuit that I, I, I sued Madonna over the movie mm-hmm. um, what, because she didn't pay us and uh, it was in our contract. It was purely contractual and everyone made it into this huge gigantic deal. But uh, I think that sort of, made her a little gun shy to get really close to her dancers. And I, I apologize to every dancer step, <laughs> but you know, I think, uh, I think Madonna really wanted literally a family. And so we were sort of an extension of that sort of longing. She kind of, you know, projected that onto us. Um, Janet, I always feel like she's more accessible. Like she's more, it seems she's more accessible, like more, um, and I can't, I can't speak with, with like absolute like uh, knowledge because I actually, when I did, if I was actually, um, I was actually one of the, the, the Asian people of the, of the video, not actually dancing on the stage with them. Okay. Um, so, uh, but from what I know, I, her, her demeanor and the way she treats her dancers, the way she is with everybody, um, she's very, um, like very accessible, completely accessible. Like she's one of us, like she's a dancer, like first and foremost. And um, she, she, she doesn't really elevate herself. Like I think sometimes Madonna might. Madonna sort of, you know, it, in her moments, she has sort of, I guess, more deeper moments. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, you know, and whereas I feel like Janet feels are very accessible. Right. And that's interesting that you would say that because like, th- I think that's almost like the across the board comments that I get from anyone that's worked with Janet, that she just treats everyone like they're part of her family and, and she acts like, like one of them and, and, and is happy to do that. So that's cool. Exactly. <clears throat> Can you talk to us about, um, cause you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the documentary. And of course I wanted to talk about, about truth or dare. Was it difficult having like the camera crew around and did you know at the time that maybe things were going to get edited, not the entire way that it should have been? Uh, when we were being filmed. Yeah. Um, you know, it was almost, it was well, it was impossible to imagine what they were going to do with it. They filmed so so much, and they kept being very clear as well with us. Like we don't know what's going to happen to it. Um, so in the in the process of filming, it was initially there was a moment of like, oh, I should watch what I'm doing on film. I should oh, I'm pay, I should pay attention. But when you're being filmed 24 hours a day for months, you sort of lose concept that there's even a camera there. Okay. Like there are so many times where I was, I was realizing this, gosh, there's not even like, Oh, they're standing in the corner. I had no idea. Um, 
And, you know, at a certain point, you have to give up the idea that you're going to have any sort of control or concept of what the final product will be. You can only just be yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, And I definitely had that moment of like, okay, (laughs) kind of whatever happens, happens. Yeah, it was, yeah, I, I, you know, at the time I didn't think, I didn't know the world was so, was, was so, had such huge, huge, strong opinions about everything that she did. I didn't realize that. I I was just having fun. It didn't seem anything, it didn't seem odd or like out of place for me. Um, But apparently for many, many, many people, it was this, you know, this moral, tragedy <laughs> like that she was you know masturbating on stage and all this stuff like it just for me it was just sort of fun and, and you know devilish devilishly kinky mm-hmm. i knew it was going to be you know a scandal of some sort i just didn't realize like how how violently people really respond to, at that time to to being confronted with sexuality and and gay people and everything that she was all the buttons that she was pushing now, when you uh, filed the lawsuit, just like you, you've explained before, it was purely about the, the contract. Um, but when you saw the film for the first time, was there anything that sort of leaped out at you or you were like, oh, no, like what what's going to happen now? And and I guess my part two question of that is, was Oliver really portrayed in the light that he should have been in that? Because like, obviously that was like a huge storyline, if you will. <laughs> um, well, first, what's jumped out for me? Um, you know, I, I really loved the movie. I had a I had a really like I was actually surprised and delighted when I saw it. Um, you know, I knew instantly watching it that Gabriel would have a major issue with uh, him and Slam kissing. Um, and he had, and when he saw that, he asked immediately to have that taken out. For me, that wasn't. I mean, that obviously I wasn't even involved in that. You know, it didn't seem a big deal to me. But for him, he didn't want to be outed, and he didn't want to be sort of that, he didn't want that on camera, especially since his family didn't even know the crime and his grandmother found out about him being gay by, by seeing that kiss on TV uh, during like the promotions for the movie before we'd even seen the movie. And for me, uh, the only one little thing stood out and that was when she mentioned like, oh, I hired a bunch of, you know, emotionally damaged or I can't remember what she said, emotionally crippled dancers or something whatever that phrase was, I was like, Wait, how does she even know? She's never even asked my background. Like she doesn't know me like that yet. Mm-hmm. You know, she knows, she knows my professional world, but, she, but I thought that was a very broad statement to say. So I didn't take it to heart as meaning myself, but it sort of became this, when you're declaring something in a movie like that, like it's truth and it sort of lives on forever. And it's like, well, there it is. It's out there. I can't take it back now. So that, 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 sort of upset me at the time. Mm-hmm. Now I could care less. <laughs> I could care less about any of it. <laughs> um, now, mean, you and the, the other six dancers, uh, you know, ha- had a bond, obviously, like like no one else, I think, especially because of being in, in, in such a spotlight and, again, having the, the Truth or Dare documentary come out. How are you approached to do the Strike a Pose documentary, and, and was it painful or en- enjoyable to sort of walk down memory lane with the other guys, especially because uh, we know Gabriel's no longer with us? Yeah, um, for Strike a Pose, this wonderful, wonderful, like truly amazing um, documentary uh, team uh, sort of, like sought us out from Amsterdam, actually. They had, I guess, been throwing around this idea for about five years um, where Ryer's uh, Juan and Esther Gould, Ryer's a, um, a journalist in Amsterdam, and he sought out Esther, who's a documentary filmmaker, um, and told her the story that like, you know, when he was growing up, it was, it was this moment when he watched, saw the movie, it was this moment of, of realizing that it's okay to be gay and it's, you know, you can be gay and normal or have fun and be successful. And, um, it just sort of inspired him. And when he spoke to Esther, she had had the same experience. And then she realized, they realized that in asking all of their friends and the people around them, that everybody had sort of had the same experience. So, um, they sought us out one by one. Um, just to check our interests, um, to see who we were, to see what sort of stories might be, um, like in what stories have happened with us over the, the course of all these years. Where did they go? You know, um, and immediately after speaking to them, I knew that their hearts were in the right places. Um, it could have easily gone gone south, and could have you know, the strike a pose could easily have been 
some sensationalist crazy piece of something if it hadn't been for these wonderful, wonderful directors with their giant hearts and just like such a clear vision of, of what they wanted to say about, about our impact. As far as Gabriel, as far as Oliver is concerned, um, I think he was shown pretty straightforward dead on. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of him. I mean, that sort of crazy, jumpy, like loud. But see, the thing is that when what maybe you didn't get from the movie is that it's all so endearing. Mm-hmm. Like it's not like it's not like he's just crazy and like oh my god, like get him away from here. He's he's loud and crazy and fun and and loves life so much that it's really endearing. And I spent a lot of time with him. Like him and Gabriel were my my hangout buddies um, the whole time. Um, and even now, like, even now he is jumpy and crazy and loud and just exactly the same, except now he's very aware of his love for us, whether we're straight or gay or whatever. Because he said back then he would have, you know, when he, he had never met gay people and he thought, you know, he wanted to punch us out. Right. You know, but now he's like, he's so, he's so huggy and lovey now. And he actually kissed me on the lips the other day. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking like, I love news. You, Kevin Watt. <laughs> What has it been like, Kevin, to to be with them again? Because I I've been fortunate, like I've been doing lots of research, you know, to do this interview, and I've, I've just seen all these pictures of you guys together again. Obviously, you know, sadly missing Gabriel, but you guys look amazing, and 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 you seem in the pictures genuinely happy to be with one another again. Oh my God, it's it's been one of it's been one of my life sort of miracles. I think seeing them all again and 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 realizing what a huge part of my life they are now and have been literally we haven't seen each other for 20 something years, even though we <laughs> were always talking about Madonna. Like she's always in our lives. You, you see her everywhere. Everyone's always reminding us. Everybody's always talking about her. And yet we hadn't even seen each other in so many years that when, when we actually got all together, it was like this confirmation of, of family, like, like seeing brothers I hadn't seen in 20 years, like even closer than my brothers probably. I've known these guys as long as I've known my actual brothers <laughs> who are about that age. It's astonishing. I think, you know, at the time when we were on tour, we loved each other and we had a good time, but we were so young. We were so young. It was a job. We didn't know it was going to be life defining, career defining. Um, and to have the hindsight of all these years, all these years to sit back and say, wow, that was really a wonderful time. And what a special time that was for all of us. And, and really respect and understand and acknowledge the importance of all of that. We're, we're just so full of gratitude for each other and love for each other that it, it's just a big love fest when we're together. I, we all go back to our same old 1990 dynamic mm-hmm. in terms of how we relate to each other, but the love and respect we have for each other is just like multiplied like a hundredfold. Joining us on the uh, the Kelly Alexander Show is dancer, choreographer, singer, actor, and director Kevin Stay, who also was uh, featured exclusively and, and extensively in the uh, Truth or Dare a documentary and dance with uh, with Madonna on the uh, Blonde Ambition Tour. Kevin, what do you want audience to take away from Strike a Pose? I would love, well, I, I, it's almost inescapable. You can't really walk away without seeing this, but um, I really want people to get the, our humanity I think part of one of the my my sort of the drawbacks to Truth or Dare is that we were sort of almost silent characters. We were made into caricatures almost of ourselves. And even though a lot of it was real, it was a very specific viewpoint. Um, and we were we were used to push buttons. Uh, and even though it was you know it's it's like a home video of our backstage even though that's all real, it's like there is a backstage to the backstage. And I think Strike a Pose gives the opportunity to really see the humanity behind what you're seeing in the show. Um, and what I would like people to take away is, is, is um, I guess, the commonality of, of humanity. I didn't even give my own, my own friends enough credit for for the big giant heroes that they are you know I, mm-hmm. I i thought i knew these people you know and then i see the movie and i'm like oh my god these these men that i've known my whole life are even bigger and better and more amazing than i ever thought uh than i ever thought before so yeah i think give people 
ask, go dig further and give people, give people a lot more credit than, than you might now. <laughs> mm. What does it people feel like, Kevin? Um, I wanted to ask you this as well, because, uh, you know, I've told you sort of through our email conversations, uh, again, how much of a Janet fan I am. And, and, you know, going back to sort of Rhythm Nation, all that stuff, it means so much to me because I was a kid at the time. And, and uh, you know, it sort of stayed with me through all these years. And, and I feel that way uh, as well about sort of the Blonde Avisha tour and Truth or Dare, because it was just at that time where it was very influential for me. So I'm assuming there's a lot of other people like me uh, who were very much into music and, and videos at the time. And, and, you know, it sort of stays with them now. What does it feel like when someone comes up to you and, and, and just tells you like how much they appreciate what you did and, and maybe not even realizing at the time, you know, how much of an, an impact that you've had on people? I gush and, and, and glow when people bring up work that I've done, because I think, you know, back in the day, there was no social media. There was no, there was no understanding of who you were reaching, who was seeing what you were doing. I I was just going job to job to job to job and had no idea that so many people were seeing what I was doing. And um, when people come up to me now uh, and and say that I had an impact on my life, like what else can you ask from, from life? Is to have your your art and your creativity and your your enjoyment like actually impact others. So for me, it it becomes the reason actually why I continue. You know, if I had just kept going, you know, blindly and, and there's a certain point I would have, I would have burned out and I, I have it sometimes, but what brings me back in are literally people saying what an impact I've had on their lives or what this job did for them or what, how they enjoyed this performance. It's like, Oh, I am, people are seeing what I'm doing. There is a reason why I'm, I'm, I'm creating or, or continuing to perform. Um, so it really, it does make a huge difference for me. I, I really something that's a big theme in my life. I really enjoy connecting with people um, and, and impacting people and just having that feedback uh, just sort of gels it in for me. When was the last time you actually spoke to Madonna and, and what would you say to her today? Cause I feel like this new experience that you've had with the guys again recently to sort of put this documentary together has obviously created like, I don't even know what, like a new level of your relationship and uh, with the other guys. So what would you want to say to Madonna like today, if you could? Let's see. Well, for, last time I saw her was maybe 2001. <laughs> I think she thought I was Michael Gregory, who was the dancer on um, <laughs> dancer on the Girly Show. Okay. I look back. I'm trying not. I, I, I can. She walked. She was having dinner at a table next to me because I was having dinner with um, David LaChapelle and Jamie King and Sharon Gold. Like just all these people that she knew from completely different areas of her life, but she didn't even know we all knew each other. Oh, wow. so we were all having dinner, and she was having dinner ne- at a table next to us with Nas. And she gets up and walks over to our table and like stands there like right next to me like oh my god Madonna hi and I'm like holding her hand and we're, we're like hugging and chatting and, and then <laughs> and she's like okay bye and then I realized wait after when 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 she left I realized wait did she just think I was Michael Gregory because I feel like if she had realized if she thought if she really realized it was me I thought she'd probably have one of those moments of like right. like <laughs> damn you. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but for me, it was wonderful because I got the chance to like, just show really, there's absolutely no hard feelings. It's all love, you know? Um, and if I had the chance to talk to her right now, I mean, first of all, I'd, I'd just, I'd laugh because <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I was, I'm such a different person than I, than I was when I was 20. Like I'm, I'm still, you know, I can go, go there pretty quickly and, and sort of fall back into that same pattern with her. Mm-hmm. But God, I'm just, I'm, I'm more outspoken. I'm bolder. I think I would just, I would just want to tell her that, that what a, a, a huge impact she had on my life and that I really do love her. And I always have, and that I was serious about, I, 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 I wrote her a letter before the lawsuit and I reread it a while back and I was like, Oh, I'm just, I was so much younger. I, I don't think I worded things the way I should have. And I felt like, God, there's just a lot of misunderstandings. And I, first of all, I'd say I'm sorry because I feel like I did. There were some misunderstandings on both parties, and I feel like she meant it. I've even understood that there was a clause in our contract for the, for the, um, for the movie. So at this point, I just feel like we need to let everything, you know, like go water under the bridge and and move forward. Um, I would just say I'm so happy to see her with a family. Also, it's beautiful to see her have kids and see the light in her face when she's talking about her kids or seeing her kids and you know there's drama that comes with that as well just like there was with her and us Mm -hmm. but um but that is it's it's been one of the most wonderful things to see her have the family that she always wanted 
And I have to ask you this before I let you go. I have two more questions I have to ask you. One, though, is because I have so many Janet fans that listen to the show, uh, and again, long-term Janet fans, because obviously in the Truth or Dare documentary, there was a little Janet comment made, uh, which I think a lot of Janet fans took the wrong way or, or were not happy with how Madonna sort of uh, had thoughts towards Janet. And I asked this actually of Tina Landon uh, a while ago when I did an interview with her, if there really was animosity between the two camps. I'm assuming not with dancers, but, but was there like a, a competitive thing going on between Madonna and Janet that you thought was palpable? I'm going to have to phrase this, phrase this very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Kevin. I'm sorry to do this to you. Oh, no, no, no. Don't be sorry. I'm like, this, I'll, I just have to make sure I phrase it the right way because of the law. So, you know, mm-hmm. I think, <laughs> I think that, yes, <laughs> that there was some serious, I don't even know that there was some serious animosity. I don't know what that was or why. Mm-hmm. Um, I know there was one specific incident that was just that I saw that I was, I couldn't believe. So it, it cinched, I can't say it, but it really cinched me. I'm like, wow, there's something really deep going on here that I'm not privy to. And, uh, and it seemed like she's, you know, only does it to, I don't know if it's specifically to, to Janet, but yeah, I, um, <laughs> I, I, it was, it was definitely an odd, it was definitely something odd, you okay. know, and, I know, like, she wouldn't, well, I don't think that she would hire Janet's dancers, and I don't think that Janet was hiring Madonna's dancers, particularly. So it was also very sort of territorial um, at that point. Okay. But I think it was more, I I, I think it was more (laughs) from, it may have been possibly more from Madonna's side than Janet's. Okay. And actually, just speaking of, of those um, specific artists, and if I can even sort of lump in um, Paul Abdul at the time, because like, right around that time, it just seemed like you were either in Madonna camp, Janet camp, or Paula camp. Like, yeah. what, if you were like a fan or, or what have you. As a dancer for Madonna at the time, did you, it's almost like I feel like it was like three sports teams going at each other. Like, did you guys feel that as, as sort of part of the Madonna team? Or were you sort of like buddies with everyone? Because I'm assuming you saw each other's at award shows and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, it felt very sort of competitive at the time, and I think that that was that that felt like it was more maybe from from our side than than like say Paula's. But like now, people cross over all the time. You go from one artist to the next, to the next. It's not a big deal, mm-hmm. um, except maybe Taylor Swift and Katy Perry. <laughs> drama there. <laughs> Apparently, there's a drama there along bad blood, but. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, back in the day, like, it was, it was a little bit more um, territorial, I think, also because we were so visible, like, you had your people. Right, you know? okay. But the thing is that over time, like, you know, Madonna moved on, I moved on, I worked with everybody else, and it just became, you know, it just became more like, oh, we're in this industry together. Right. Was you it know, hard for you, Kevin? Sort of territorialism disappeared. Was it hard for you, Kevin, to get a job, though, sort of immediately following? Because it's almost like I feel like, you know, sometimes actors, after they do some sort of prolific movie, uh, let's say like Twilight, right? Like like for Pattinson, yeah. like <laughs> it's hard for him to go to something new right away. So was that f- like the same for you guys, like where it was hard to get cast or to, to, to be picked as dancers mm-hmm. for someone else? Well, the thing is, right away after, um, immediately after I did Star Search, and then I started working with Michael Jackson, and um, and then I was doing Newsies, the movie. So it was character stuff. Okay. You know, Star Search was my own stuff. Um, I won Star Search. Woohoo! That's awesome. Um, but then, <laughs> but then, like Newsies was character in a movie, so I didn't really have to think about, you know, I'm so and so's dancer. But when I did go out for Michael Jackson's tour, they didn't hire me because of my visibility with Madonna. Wow. Yeah, so it did limit me in many ways. Okay. And for many years, I actually took it off my resume, especially after the lawsuit, because I didn't want people to keep telling me, you're just standing on her back and you're using her. I'm like, I am not using her at all. In fact, I, I'm not even have a reason to have her on my resume. I don't talk about her. Right. Like, if you look at the rest of my resume, that's like it's like one little blip on my on my career. And so I don't mind talking about it, of course, you know, that's, mm-hmm. that's one of the things I didn't mention before is that with, with Strike a Pose, it's this wonderful opportunity to actually talk about that era and that life and that world that I really didn't talk about at all, literally since the lawsuit. Oh, wow. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's actually really nice to, to talk about all of this and revisit and remember and, and talk about it all with the boys and, and see their perspectives on it and, their, and learning about what actually happened in many ways, you know, we didn't even know about. Um, 
but yeah, moving on from 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 Madonna was a mixed bag. Okay. Definitely a mixed bag. Now I could talk to you all day, but I don't want to do that to you. But I, I do want to ask you a final <laughs> question. Uh, what is up up next for you? And and also, where can people see uh, the Strike Opposed documentary? Let's see. Um, well, what's next for me? I uh, I shot a documentary uh, with my father uh, two years ago, and I'm in the process of editing that right now. Um, I am writing a memoir um, that I'm also quite a long ways in as well. Uh, and I have a music project called That Rogue Romeo. Um, I released two albums. Uh, you can go find that all on thatrogueromeo.com. Uh, and I really enjoy that, and I want to continue doing some more uh, some more work with that. So I'm working on new music for that. Um, what was the other Strike a pose. Question? Yeah, where can people uh, see Strike a pose? Strike a pose um, is playing um, is premiering in the U.S. at Tribeca Film Festival on April 15th. Um, uh, Strike a pose will be filming or Strike a pose will be screening at Hot Docs in Toronto on April 29th. Uh, awesome. And then I, I think there's a couple more showings after that. Um, I think I'm not sure I can say any of the other dates because I don't think they've been announced. But there are many others. Uh, there are many other cities coming up for the festival for festival dates. Uh, and I think that's all I'm allowed to say. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Well, thank you so much for this. It honestly, it's been an honor to to speak with you and to sort of hear what was what you know what it was like back in the day and, and working with Madonna and all that sort of good stuff. And I'm so happy that you guys were able to do this uh, this new documentary so people can catch up with you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That is the multi talented artist Kevin Stay. Make sure to check him out on his website thatrogueromeo.com. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch the video. We've got a lot more great content coming your way. So make sure to subscribe right here and check out all that's coming up on The Kelly Alexander Show.